Happy Sabbath, church. Aren't you glad to be alive on this morning? Psalms 150 simply states, Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, praise God in his holy place. Praise him in the vault of heaven, the vault of his power. Praise him for his mighty works. Praise him for his immeasurable greatness. Praise him with fanfare on the trumpet. Praise him upon lute and harp. Praise him with tambourines and dancing. Praise him with the flute and strings. Praise him with the clashing of cymbals. Praise him with triumphant cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, God, and friend, we come before you now just to say thank you, God. With praise on our lips and adoration, God, upon our hearts, God, we're asking you to come and saturate this place, dear God. Be with us, God, as we go forth into this service, God. Shift this place, God, with your spirit. Dwell among us, God, as you have always done in the past, dear Father. God, save, heal, deliver, and set free. In thy most holy and precious name, amen. The month of March is designated as Human History Month by a presidential proclamation which celebrates the contributions women have made to the United States and recognizes the specific achievements women have made over the course of American history in a variety of fields. Today, I choose to celebrate Rahab, a woman of the Bible. Rahab was a woman with a bad reputation in the ancient city of Jericho where two spies from Israel had gone to check out the land and see if they could conquer it. Rahab was a Canaanite, but she trusted in Israel's God. Rahab showed herself to be brave, bold, and loyal to God, in spite of great danger from king of her own city, Jericho. She recognized God's greatness from just the stories she had heard, and chose whose side she wanted to be on. As a result, she was the only one in her city to be saved. We too can make a choice that can positively impact our lives by being brave, bold, strong, and loyal to God in the face of adversity and ridicule. Sometimes we must stand alone like Rahab for the cause of God. Whose side are you on today? Let us purpose to be a Rahab and in the end, we'll make it to the kingdom. Today's announcements follow. Today is Young Adult Mission Day. March 21st to the 27th is Youth Week of Prayer. Do have a blessed Sabbath. Submit to His will. The song just simply says this. Lord, I decrease so
your prayer. I need you to lift your voice where you are. Can you just sing that part with us and say, Don't let my will get in the way. Come on, just make a, a cry unto the Lord. Just let your voices ring. Say, Don't let my will, yeah. my wills, my wants, God, I leave it at your feet. I surrender all to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender Don't let my will get in the way. Don't let my flesh drive you away. Lord, I decrease. Have your way in me. Lord, I decrease. Have Sabbath Church. My name is Kenny Karanga Guzman, and I'm honored to be a part of Young Adult Day because I get to tell you a little bit more about Mount Sinai Seventh Day Adventist Church. My Mount Sinai is a really special place because it's a community church. In fact, every single Wednesday, a wonderful group of volunteers gather to clothe and feed the local community. At our church pantry, especially during these times, lines can be long, people often wait hours to get help. And you might be asking, well, with a great group of volunteers, where's the need? Well, in the back of the church, we have a special shed. It contains freezers, so items stay at the right temperature, and refrigerators, so we can offer fresh fruits and vegetables, bread and milk, and room to store all the clothes and canned good items. And it's all made possible by your generous offerings. Tithes are a wonderful part of your stewardship, and they go to the global church and help on a worldwide basis. Offerings stay right here at home. They help with the professional music you hear during our services that help you praise with your whole spirit. They help provide AY and youth programs. They also go to keep the cameras and the lights rolling week after week so we can be together even during a global pandemic. All your offerings go towards the church combined budget. That's right, a budget. Just like your home, church operates on a budget that allows us to equitably support all of our ministries. So how can you help? Well, there are four super easy ways to give, and they're up on the screen right now. You'll see that there's even an app for that. It doesn't matter what kind of phone you have, and 
We are in the 20th century, so now we have Cash App. You can give in whatever way you feel most comfortable. You can also give to special projects like our church's building funds. Now, be generous, just like Jesus is generous. God doesn't care if you have two pennies or two billion dollars. In fact, when you give according to what you have, and give a gift from your heart, Jesus knows, he sees, and he honors and blesses that gift to do more than you could ever imagine. Our only goal here is to just be more like Jesus in our Christian walk. In fact, in 1 John 2 verse 6, it says, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which Jesus walked. So today, I'm encouraging you, I'm encouraging myself, all of you young adult professionals out there, I know you have bills and obligations and families to provide for, but Jesus says we should live a generous life. We open to give to him and he helps us to receive the blessings. So follow in the footsteps of your Savior. Come with me. Let's live a generous life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you today for a special blessing on all of those who have to give and who do not have to give. Lord, I ask that you be with every single person. Please bring an end to this pandemic. And Lord, I ask that you help us in our daily walk with you. Help us to continue to strive to be like you and to strive to be generous with our gifts. And Lord, I ask that you be with all the young adults, all the professionals, all of those, Lord, that are just trying to live and grow in you. Be with them and bless the offerings that we've collected. Amen. to invite you to the throne of grace as we come before God. We have so much to give God thanks for. We know the difficult times that we're in and so the fact that we're alive and we're watching and we're worshiping wherever we are is enough reason to just give God all the glory and all the praise. And at this time I just invite you to bow your heads with mighty Father we come into your presence this morning Nothing good that we have done while you've spared our lives to see this another day. But it's because of your mercy and your grace. And we want to say thank you. Lord, we're grateful that we have a God that we can come into your presence, Lord, that we do not need to go through a priest. But we can come and we can lay all our troubles, all our burdens at your feet. And I want to say thank you, Lord. Lord, at this time, I pray that you may touch me, forgive me, Lord, for my sins, Lord. I'm not worthy to speak on behalf of your young people, Lord. But I know, Lord, that you have redeemed us. You have redeemed me. And so I come boldly before the throne of grace. At this time, Lord, I pray that you may look down on us, the young people of Mount Sinai and all the young people across the world. And help us, Lord, to realize that we need Jesus, Lord. That it's high time that we wake up, Lord, and surrender our all to you. 
because there's no other way. We're a passionate group, Lord. We're at this age, young adulthood, where we're passionate about our dreams. We have so much that we would like to accomplish. But help us, Lord, that we may realize that we need you and that nothing can be done that is good and nothing can be accomplished, Lord, unless we surrender it to you. Father, at this time, I pray for the family of Mount Sinai, the families all over that are worshiping remotely. And I pray that you may continue to bless us, continue to provide for us. Some people's jobs were affected. A lot of people are in need of resources. And I pray that you may be their provider and let them not forget to say thank you. Help us, Lord, that we may never wake up a day without forgetting to say thank you because many people have lost their lives and we're here. So at this time, I pray that you may continue to bless us. Please put the words in the pastor's mouth that as he speaks to us, Lord, we may be able to understand clearly that we may be able to apply your words, Lord, to our lives to help us to become better Christians. Bless the pastor, Lord, at this time and his family, Pastor Kelly. And continue to bless all the young people of this church and help us that we may continue to grow in grace. Lord, if there's anything that I fail to ask of you, please do not fail to grant it unto us because we ask in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. He loves us. Oh, wow. We love us. Oh, how we love us. Oh, how we love us. He loves us. Oh, how we love us. Oh, how we love us. Oh, how we and girls happy sabbath and happy women's history month welcome once again to your time is story time and so uh, in keeping with uh, women's history month i'd like to share with you a clip on how it all started in the united states of america so they will give you a history of how women's history month came into being and then boys and girls i'm so excited uh, that two wonderful ladies will be sharing their history with you um a, a present mount sinai member and a past mount sinai member will be telling you their story i'm so excited about that in the united states march is women's history month it honors women's contributions in all areas of life as scientists, inventors, artists, politicians, and more. The celebration began in 1978 when the School District of Sonoma, California hosted a week-long recognition of women's accomplishments throughout history. The idea spread, and in 1980, President Jimmy Carter proclaimed the week of March 8th National Women's History Week. Six years later, an organization called the National Women's History Project convinced Congress to dedicate the entire month of March to women's history. Each year, a special focus for the month is declared by the National Women's History Project. For example, important artists like photographer Dorothea Lange and painter Mary Cassatt have been celebrated. Pioneers such as educator Mary McLeod Bethune, Clara Barton, who founded the Red Cross, Amelia Earhart in aviation, and First Lady Michelle Obama have also been honored. 
Women's History Month celebrates unsung heroes, too. The countless women who helped when our country was at war. Women who run businesses and volunteer in their communities. Single mothers who work and raise families. And the unknown writers and artists in history whose works were never made public, yet teach historians much about our country's past. Which women in your life would you like to celebrate? And now you'll be hearing from these two beautiful ladies. Happy Sabbath to all the girls and young ladies watching this out there. March is a super special month because it's Women's History Month where we commemorate and celebrate all the lives of the women who've had a vital role. Hi, Mom. I'm Kemi Karanga Guzman, and I'm an attorney at a premier law firm. I specialize in human resources and talent development, especially mentoring and coaching. Did I always know what I wanted to do or where my journey was going to take me? Of course not. When I graduated from law school, there was a really bad recession and the job market was super rough, just like it is today. Do you ever wish that you could get an answer to a prayer right away? Do you ever wish you knew your future today? Sometimes I do. It's really hard to wait, especially in a difficult situation, for God to answer. It can make you worry. I know because I'm a worrier. In Luke 1, verse 45, it says, Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. This means God is someone you can trust. He is going to fulfill his promises. And he's watching out for you. He knows where you started. And best part, he knows where you're going to end up. I can tell you that my path was filled with twists and turns, there were ups and there were some downs. But now I know that everything that happened, different jobs, jobs I got and some I didn't, were to prepare me so that I would be ready for where I am today. So now I try to praise when I start to feel the worry. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. Psalm 139 verse 14. So perhaps you're young and just starting out and not sure what you want to do. Maybe you're graduating this year into this really rough job market and you don't know where your first job opportunity is going to come from or if it's even going to be the right one. Or maybe you're at a transition. Wherever you are and whatever you're doing, know that God has a plan. Praise Him. Trust Him. He'll light your path. Good morning, boys and girls. My name is Auntie Kathy, and I want to wish you a happy Sabbath and a happy Women's History Month. As a woman, God has given me success in many areas of my life, and I thank Him and give Him the glory. He has allowed me to be a physician with a wonderful career. He's given me a beautiful family and excellent health. And I want the same for you. And I'm going to share with you a few things that helped me along the way. The first is having the right BFF. The second is reading the right books. And the third for me was memorizing the right songs. So let me get more specific. Having the right BFF. Since I was a little girl, my best friend forever was God. Having God as your best friend really helps you to be strong and courageous during difficult times. Speaking to him every morning and every night, asking him for direction in everything that you do really helps you to choose the best path to success. The second, reading the right books. Studying the Bible is an excellent way to start. As a little child, even now, if you memorize God's words, it will help you to make the best choices for a lifetime. There's one scripture I love so much. It says, 
trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. God's Bible is filled with awesome messages that will help you to know exactly which way to go. So if you can read, pick up your Bible and read it every day. And then memorizing the right songs. Which songs helped me? Well, hymns. As a little girl, I had a hymnal. And just singing those songs every day, like trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Those songs came back to me at the right time. Whenever I was down or confused or felt like I didn't know what to do, they always reminded me that trusting in God and obeying His will will lead me to true success. So, to my young woman, my little girls listening to me right now, God has success in your future. And even now you can be successful when you have the right BFF, that is God, you study His Bible by memorizing His scripture, and singing songs like hymns that help to lift you up and push you forward at just the right time. I wish you much success now and in the future in God's way. Thank you so very much, Kemi. And thank you so very much, Kathy, for sharing and, and, and teaching the, the, our young girls, our young ladies, the little ones, the older ones, uh, that they too can have achieved their goals despite the obstacles, despite no matter what life throws at you, as long as you are connected to God, um, He will help you through. He has promised that He will never leave you or forsake you, that He will be with you and He will see you through. As, the, as you heard, they did have their fair share of difficulties, but they persevered and with God's help, they became successful and now they can encourage you that no matter where you're at now, uh, uh, go for your goals and, and you will succeed with Christ in the vessel. You can smile at the storm. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, Lord, thank you so much for your many blessings. Thank you, Lord, that with you all things are possible. And Father God, as these young people grow up, uh, to as they go, go, go through the different stages of their studies, um, through high school, through college, um, maybe getting a second degree, Father God, whatever it is, or they just decide to go into um, doing something for themselves or whatever it is that they choose to do, Father God. I pray that you will be with them, Father God. Hold their hands. Lead them through, O oh God. And I pray, dear God, that they will, if you will help them to depend upon you, on, on you, dear Lord, because with you, we without you, we can do nothing. So, Lord, bless the boys and girls today. Bless the girls, Father God, and let them know that they too can become successful um, once they, they, they depend on you, dear Father God. Bless us again, we pray, O oh God. Send your Holy Spirit to, to, to abide with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Boys and girls, thank you for listening. God bless you and see you next time. God's love is so wonderful. God's love is so wonderful. God's love is so wonderful. Just to dwell, dwell, dwell here forever. This will be my posture, laying at your feet. Oh, just to dwell, dwell, dwell here forever. Dearest 
father, closest friend, most beautiful, most beautiful, oh, dearest father, closest friend, most beautiful. Most beautiful, one thing I decide. One thing I decide. Yeah. Only thing I see. Only this I see. Just to dwell. Just to dwell, dwell, dwell. Thank you, Jesus. forever. This will be my part. This will be my part. I'm laying at your feet. Laying at your feet. Oh, just to dwell. Oh, just to dwell, dwell. Dearest Father, Father, what a friend we have in you, you are. Dearest Father, you are my friend, and I call you, you are, you are. There's nothing left, my heart it sings to you. Oh, 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 there are no words. There's nothing left, my love it sings to you.
touch Jesus in you. You are a good, good father. We love you. Say, oh, oh, oh. You are a good father. Somebody praise him right where you are. Right where you are, he's so beautiful. We lay at your feet, God. We give it up to you. All of our praise and our worship, we give it up to you. Oh, somebody cry out, oh, to Jesus. Somebody, wherever you are, in your kitchen, in your living room, in your bedroom, just say, oh, I don't know what you're going through. And you may not even know how to pray for it, but I just need you to open up your mouth and cry out, and cry out, cry out of tears. We love you, God. We thank you for understanding what it is that we need. Hallelujah. Somebody open up your mouth and pray. Pray right now. Pray for where you are. Pray for where you need to go. Oh, we need you, Jesus. We haven't seen your face physically, but we know your beauty by what you have done. And we know your beauty because of who you are, Jesus. And we thank you for that. We thank you for that, God. Happy Sabbath, Mount Sinai. Our scripture reading today is taken from 1 Samuel 22, 1 through 5. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Adlam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. And David went thence to Mizpah of Moab, and he said unto the king of Moab, let my father and my mother, I pray thee, come forth and be with you, till I know what God will do for me. And he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him, all the while that David was in the hold. And the prophet Gad said unto David, abide not in the hold, depart and get thee in the land of Judah. Then David departed and came into the forest of Hare. Here endeth the reading of God's holy word. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Mount Sinai, and a special happy Sabbath to all the young adults watching with us today. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker for today, Pastor Daniel Kelly. He is a lover of God, an evangelism enthusiast, and he loves making church the perfect place for imperfect people. So after the song of meditation by Kamala Emanuel, the next voice you're going to hear is that of Pastor Daniel Kelly. Be blessed. God, we want you to inhabit in our praises. Make this your dwelling place. I'll sing like there's nobody listening but you. Yeah. And I'll dance like there's nobody watching but you. And I'll worship with my last breath. Give my all till there's nothing left. My focus is you. Jesus, you are the center. My hope, my treasures I found in you. I'll sing your praises forever. My love, my life, I give to you.
can build your home on my words I'll stay right here where I'm welcome You can build your home on my words And I'm staying, Lord, I'll stay right here Jesus, oh, build your home right here. Set. Build your home right here. Hey. 
build your home right here right on my heart Jesus that's my cry I'll say it over and over again that's where I need you to be that's where I need you to be don't leave me don't leave me just build your home right on my heart we love you Jesus we need you to build your home don't leave us build your home right here with me just build your home I know I don't deserve it I need you to build your home thank you God build your home oh, oh. We invite you in this place Only you alone are worthy, Jesus You are the great I am, God You are the great I am You are El Shaddai You are El Shaddai And we love you, Jesus We need you to stay We need you to stay Don't leave us, God In the midnight hour, you are there When I'm crying on my knees, you are there Grateful to be together with you at the Mount Sinai Seventh-day Adventist Church. Thank you to your pastor, uh, Pastor Jackson, and to my good friend, Socrates Joseph, for inviting me to spend this youth and young adult Sabbath with you. We are so grateful for what the Lord is doing in that part of the vineyard, and we're so grateful for the opportunity for us to be together with you, although not in person, uh, but we are sharing this virtual space and for this, we're grateful. I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 22. Uh, and there I want us to highlight just the first five verses of that chapter. 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. You can follow along the translation of your comfort. The Bible says, David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him, and he became commander over them. And there were with him about 400 men. And David went from there to Mizpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and my mother stay with you till I know what God will do for me. And he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. Then the prophet Gad said to David, Do not remain in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah. And so David departed and went in the forest of Hereth. And considering your theme for this year, reset, recommit, and restore, I want to speak to you under the topic today, exit strategy. We're praying, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we're grateful for this opportunity and time once again where we could sit at your feet and hear your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit will move in every heart as we listen to your word today. We pray for preaching power, Lord, let your word go forth clearly that we all may understand. And we promise that Jesus and Jesus alone will get the glory in this. For we ask it in none other name than Jesus the Christ, our, your son and our savior. Amen, amen, and amen. Exit strategy. Cabin fever is described as irritability, listlessness, and similar symptoms resulting from long confinement or isolation endures during the winter. In like manner, the term stir crazy is defined as being distraught because of prolonged confinement. Simply put, nobody likes to be confined and constricted, restricted, or restrained. 
No matter how large or lovely your home is, if you spend enough time in there, after a while, the walls will begin to close in on you. Uh, people are anxious to reopen states and businesses today, not because the virus is gone and not because a cure has been found. We thank God that, uh, that the Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson and Johnson was able to develop a vaccine. Uh, but keep in mind, a vaccine is not a cure. A vaccine just prevents the symptoms from taking us out. Uh, but no, no cure has yet been found for coronavirus, yet it's still, people are desirous to reopen uh, for two main reasons. And number one is because the economy is a mess. And number two, people are simply tired of being confined to their homes. Um, and the experience of one who is confined for proactive reasons is far different than the experience of one who has to shelter in place as a reaction. Uh, in other words, when you nor anyone around you is inflicted, shelter in place seems like a punishment. You just want to be outside. But when you are afflicted, infected, or uh, inflicted, the last thing on your mind is getting out or going to the beach or to the store. You just want to get out alive. And the truth is so wonderfully illustrated in the passage of our consideration today. Uh, by the time we reach 1 Samuel chapter 22, our friend David has already been through a lot. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 13, the Bible tells us that he had received the anointing of God and that the Holy Spirit of the Lord was upon David. And one would think that David would go from receiving the anointing to walking into his assignment. Uh, but we see in scripture that between the anointing and the assignment, David encountered an assassin. First of all, he encountered Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. And we see his great victory over Goliath, which shows us that by the power of God, we can have victory over giants. David experienced immediate fame and popularity because of his great victory over Goliath. But not only that, in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 18, David gets married to his, the other assassin in his life, Saul's daughter. Uh, could you believe that today? David got married to the enemy's daughter. And it is here that we must be reminded that sometimes the devil will put the man of, or who you think is the man of your dreams or the woman of your dreams in your life, but that individual may very well be trained to keep you down. It's interesting to me, those of us who frequent the pages of sacred scriptures would notice that every time McCall, Saul's daughter, is referenced in the word, we notice that she's usually referenced as Saul's daughter more than she was referenced as David's wife. Um, and that's the the, the, the author's way of letting us know that her loyalty was more to her daddy than it was to her husband. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 18, 20 and 21, that McCall, Saul's daughter, loved David and they told Saul and the thing pleased him. And the Bible says that Saul said, I will give him to her that she may be a snare or a trap to him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore Saul said to David, thou shalt take Thou, thou shalt this day be my son-in-law and the one of the twain. Uh, David did not even have time to celebrate his marriage because he had to deal with the dangers of, from the Philistines because, of course, they wanted his life. Not only that, he also had to deal with his father-in-law who repeatedly attempted to take his life. Remember that Saul became jealous of David when he discovered that he would not be able to formulate a dynasty where he would pass the kingdom down to his son and the kingdom stays within his family. And when he heard that the anointing had gone from him to David, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 18, 28 and 29, that Saul became David's enemy continually. Saul heard the songs and uh, that the people were singing, saying that Saul had slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And, uh, and, and Saul became jealous when they sang of David. And when he considered the fact that he would not be able to formulate a dynasty, he became enraged. Furthermore, when he considered the fact that David wasn't even king yet, but his reputation was better than Saul's was, Saul wanted to kill David. 
And so David was on the run from the Philistines and he was also on the run from Saul. He went from immediate fame to being a fugitive. And uh, when you look at the previous chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 21, you discover that David ran from Saul into enemy ter territory. He ran to the city of Gath. That's a Philistine city. And he went there and he came before the king. The problem was that when David stood before the king, David had become so famous that the king of Gath began to recognize David and he said aren't you the king of the land and it's interesting to me that David wasn't even the king yet but he was recognized by the Philistine king as the king of God's people and so David had to think quickly and he began to act crazy and he began to let his spit fall on his beard and roll around on the floor and so the king kicked him out and said I have enough crazy people in my kingdom I don't need another one and so now David David leaves and, and, and he leaves with praises on his lips because the reality is that the Philistines wanted him dead and the fact that he was able to go before the presence of the king and be recognized as the king of Israel and still leave with his life caused David a great amount of joy because he was able to leave there alive and we discover that Psalm 34 is the psalm that David wrote after this experience in Gath. After leaving the presence of the king, when the president, when the president, when the king recognized him, he should have killed him. But he left there alive, and then he began to write down, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. David is excited, he's exuberant with praise. He says, My soul shall make her boast in the Lord, and the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. He said, Oh man magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he delivered me from all my fears. He said this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. And then he said the angel of the Lord encampeth around them that fear him and delivers them. He said oh taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. He says the righteous cry unto the Lord and he heareth them and delivered them out of all their troubles. He said, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. David was excited. He was pumped up. His escape from the Philistine city of Gath without even a scratch on him put praises on his lips. So David is giving God praise for his deliverance, but after the high praise wore off and after the songs were finished, after the exhilaration of God's deliverance wore off, David had a serious problem to consider, and that is, what do I do now? And I wish I could talk to every musician and every singer and every preacher in the building, everybody who's ever had to stand up for God and lift your voice for God or, or, or prepare a message or, or, or do, 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 you know, put, to, to put together slides for the Lord or, or do whatever God has called you to do in service. And that is after you've prepared and after you've presented, now what? Because the reality is that many of us know that the devil targets giftedness. Many of us know that the devil, he doesn't leave those who are gifted alone. And so often we, in our preparation and in our presentation, we experience the exhilaration. But then when the exhilaration wears off, we got to deal with ourselves. We, we, we do well in a spiritually charged atmosphere. But when all of this is shut up and the music stops and the sermon is over, you're left alone with yourself and your thoughts like David. And we got to ask ourselves... What's next? This season ought to teach us, beloved, to have a worship experience that is more authentic and less superficial. I'm going to give you that again. This season ought to teach us to have a worship experience that is more authentic and less superficial. It reminds me of the woman at the well where she wanted to cut. She was comfortable coming to the well daily to draw the water that she needed. But Jesus said that I want to put a well inside of you so that you're not dependent on an external well. And can I let you know today that God is trying to put some internal wells inside of us. Wells that are not dependent.
dependent on the external. Wells that don't need a choir or a praise team or a preacher to pump us up. Wells that are internal. Wells that when we wake up in the morning, we wake up already pumped up. We are just grateful that God gave us another opportunity for grace and another opportunity for forgiveness and another opportunity to be in the land of the living. We God is looking for a church that has an internal well inside of it. I love the church atmosphere, but worship is more than just that. When you have to go back to your broken homes, when you have to go back to your abusive husband, when you gotta go back to your stressful wife, when you gotta go back to your annoying job, or when you gotta go back to your ungodly friends, you need to learn to seek God for yourself. You've got to know him for yourself on a personal level that goes that far surpasses and goes deeper than the superficial and the surface level of what we do in church. And sometimes we get too dependent on the well choreographed religious atmosphere and we don't know how to operate without the glamour of organized worship. I say it all the time, but I wish I had my organist with me when I'm standing on the unemployment line. I wish I had my praise team with me when I'm standing in, in the doctor's office and about to receive bad news. I wish, I wish I had the, the prayer team with me when I get in an accident on the interstate. But when they're not around, I've got to learn to just have that personal relationship with God. I've got to learn how to know him for myself. I've got to learn I could, could how to connect with him for myself because we've got to understand that there are not just mountains in the Christian experience but there are also valleys in the Christian journey and you've got to be ready to face them head on and keep in mind that the God on the mountain is still God in the valley when things go wrong he'll make them right the God of the good times is still God in the bad times the God of the day is still God in the night and we're living in a time where we have itching ears and, and we search for uh, this experience, this placebo as it were, where, this, where, the, where, where we need this and that and the other to be right in place uh, in order for us to give God praise. But I wonder if I got two or three individuals in their home today who is able to praise God right where you are because you realize that if it had not been for the Lord on your side. The Bible says that David departed from the city of Gath and escaped to Adullam. Adullam, that is David's place of refuge. Now, notice that he didn't go to the house. He didn't go to the palace. He didn't go to the prophet Samuel. He didn't go to his best friend, Jonathan. He didn't go to the ungodly again after he did that the first time. Where do you go when you have nowhere else to turn? Where do you go when mother forsake you and father forsake you and sister? and brother forsake you and friend forsake you where do you go when there's nowhere else to go you need to seek refuge and the problem is that for many of us like David we seek refuge in the wrong places and the wrong things that's what happened when he went to the Philistine city of Gath David first sought refuge in enemy's territory and when that didn't work he sought refuge in the cave Adullam now the word Adullam literally means refuge but what David had to realize was that the cave wasn't supposed to be his permanent refuge. You see, shelter in place is not a curse. And I tell folk all the time, I'm an introvert. Really, I'm an ambivert, but more introvert than ambivert. But I, I'm, I'm used to solitary. Uh, I, I, I draw strength from solitude, right? Uh, so, so, so I was built for shelter in place. Uh, but we've got to understand that it is a temporary refuge while we await a permanent solution. That was so nice, I'm going to say it twice. The shelter in place is a temporary refuge. It's not a cure. It is a temporary refuge for us us to await permanent a solution and the Lord wanted David to learn then and for us to learn today that he was only he's, that God is the only true refuge in the time of trouble and so the cave was for David to reset and recommit and get restored to go out and do what God anointed him to do all the way back in first Samuel chapter 16. And many times we run to the bar in the hands or in the hands of a man or in the hands of a woman to find refuge. But we need to learn to find our refuge in God. For the Lord is the refuge of the oppressed. He's the refuge in times of trouble. Psalm 46 1 tells us that God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in time of trouble. God is our refuge. 
Uh, most archaeologists believe that the cave of Dullam was nestled in the hills of Judah, not too far from where David defeated Goliath in the valley of Elah. He went from such a triumphant victory to running like a criminal and hiding in a cave like an animal. And if I can give every believer under the sound of my voice today some advice, it would be this. Never get too happy when you get the victory over something. Because problems and struggles are like Kleenex. You pull one out and another one just kind of pops right up. And at least don't get so happy to where you let your guard down. Because even when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, the Bible says in Luke 4.13 that when the devil ended his temptation, he departed from him, watch this, for a season. If the devil won't leave Jesus alone, then what do you think he's going to do with you and me? The devil doesn't just leave you alone after you win a victory against him, but he goes and he rethinks and he, 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 re, he revises his assault and, and then he comes back and tries it again. And so David wrote in Psalm 142, while he's in the cave of Adullam, he wrote in Psalm 142, not, not, not only is this, uh, was David sheltered in place, but he started out isolated and alone, and, 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 but the, the wrong refuge will, will always fail you. But, but notice what David writes in Psalm, in Psalm uh, 142 while he's in the cave of Dullam. Let me, let me read that to you uh, quickly today. Psalm 142, uh, he says, with my voice I cried unto the Lord. And with my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. He says, I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way in the path where I walk. They have hidden a trap for me. Look at the right and see there is none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. He said, no one cares for my soul. David is in the cave of Dullam and it appears as if he is throwing himself a pity party. Uh, and, and he says, I cry to you, O Lord. I say you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison. Anybody feel like you prison in the stronghold? He says, bring me out of prison that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for they will deal bountifully with me. David is hiding in a cave. And he feels... As if he's all alone. He said, Lord, I wanted you to be my refuge, but I feel like you're not doing what you need to do. So let me find refuge in the cave. And while he's there, something interesting happens. In 1 Samuel 22, let's look at verses 1 and 2. The Bible says that when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was bitter of the soul gathered to him and he became commander over them. And there were with him about 400 men. Here it is. People followed David into the cave. Now David knew what it meant to be a leader. He had natural leadership instincts in him. And so the ones that followed were not in the same danger that he was, yet they followed him into hiding. By the time he looked around, there were about 400 men with him. And what a powerful testimony it would have been for David if he would have led them up to the Lord. But instead, he led them down to the cave. The cave and the crave for the cave can lead, if you're not careful, to the grave. The Bible says that David developed a following. Uh, first, David's family came. Um, and at the surface, that may not seem like much to you, but you've got to realize that this was a gift of God because previously, David was a nobody in the eyes of his family. They had so little regard for David. They thought so little of David. His father Jesse thought little of him. That he wasn't even invited to the dinner when the prophet Samuel came to anoint the new king in 1 Kings 16, 11. When Samuel came and, and, and to find and anoint the king, David wasn't even invited. In 1 Samuel 17, 28, David's oldest brother, Eliab, unjustly accused and criticized David. And so David's family at first seemed to be against him, but now they're following him. Not only that, verse 2 says that everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto David. What an interesting group of followers. 
God called an unlikely and unique group to David's Adullam cave. And these were probably not the men that David would have chosen for himself, but they were the men that God called and assigned to follow David. These men were in distress. Their own lives were in disarray and not put together. They had problems of their own, yet God called them to follow David. These men were in debt. They didn't have any money. They haven't seen a lot of success in their past, but they learned from their past failures. They had problems of their own, yet God called them to follow David. These men were discontented. The Hebrew word discontented uh, it, it means bitter of the soul. They knew the bitterness of life. They were not satisfied with their own lives or the leadership of King Saul. They wanted something different. They wanted something better. They had problems of their own, yet God called them to follow David. And it was only those who were sick of the reign of Saul that came to David. You see, people who are sick of the enemy's grip uh, on them are often the ones that God strategically places around us uh, so that we can lead them right to Jesus Christ. We often want the refined folk to join our churches. We often want folk who have no debt to join our church. We often want folk uh, who got their whole life together to be a part of our fellowship. Uh, but we've got to understand that every now and then God sends the bitter and the disenfranchised and the indebted. Uh, he sends the ostracized and the marginalized and, and the criticized uh, to be a part of our fellowship because those who prospered under the uh, wicked king Saul were uncomfortable with him. It's kind of like those who prospered under the former president uh, are the ones who are comfortable with his foolishness. Uh, but some people are just comfortable following the wrong leader. Now fast forward to the future. When David becomes king, everybody's going to want to be around him. But today, I praise God for the 400 that accompanied him even when he was a nobody hiding in a cave. That's a real friend, y'all. A real friend stands by you through thick and thin. A real friend stands by you when you have and when you have not. A real friend stands with you when you're up and cares for you when you're down. I always tell folk, uh, if you want to know who your real friends are, get into some trouble. And you'll see who sticks by you. If you don't want to be my friend while I was riding on the bus, then don't try to be my friend when I'm driving my BMW, y'all. If you don't want to be my friend when I didn't have two dimes to rub, to rub together, then don't come around when I'm financially stable. And so many people are people's friends just as long as they could get stuff. That's why I tell folk all the time, I'd rather four quarters than a hundred pennies. God sent 400 men that were bold enough and brave enough and honest enough to follow David even in the cave. These men were distressed, they were depressed, they were dissatisfied, they were bankrupt, but notice that these are the people that comes to Christ. They have come to him recognizing their distress, their debt, their bankruptcy, and are conscious of the fact that they are in need of something. And it's hard to conceive someone who has everything that they need something or even someone and so that's why Jesus often calls the distressed and the depressed and the dissatisfied and the downtrodden and the spiritually bankrupt and he says come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest the pressure or frustration of their life drives them to refuge found only in the safety of the sovereign savior and so verse 2 tells us that David became the captain of these 400 men. And it is here that I hear the Spirit reminding me that you must be faithful on the sidelines in order to be fruitful on the front lines. The Bible says that he became captain over these 400 men. And in this sense, David becomes a type of Christ. He, he, he becomes a type of Christ because Christ is the captain of our salvation. When you come to Christ all stained with sin and depression and discouragement and doubt and fear, you may come that way, but thank God you won't leave that way. They came to David in distress, in debt and discontented, but they didn't stay that way. And notice, it is possible that David could have used these men who were all tired of Saul's reign and probably would have uh, agreed with David that Saul was not fear and they would have been happy to aid David in revenge against Saul. But David never used these men that followed him into the cave inappropriately. This would have been the 
perfect opportunity for David to start an insurrection and go march to the capital. I mean, um, and and rebel against Saul if David wanted to, because an unprincipled leader would have made these four hundred men into a gang of cutthroat thugs. But David would never allow them to become a rebel army against Saul. That's because David understood the importance of keeping his hands off of God's anointed so that even when he had the opportunity to kill Saul David said in 1 Samuel 26 11 that the Lord forbid that I should stretch my hand against the Lord's anointed and can I let you know today beloved that you better be careful what you put your hands on you better be careful where you put your mouth because when you touch what God has anointed God will curse your hands David became the captain over them and made them into mighty men of valor he made them into men trained for battle he made them into men who could handle the shield and despair he made them into men whose faces were like lions and they were swift like gazelles on the mountain as a matter of fact the bible says in first chronicles 12 8 that the slowest weakest and the worst of david's warriors was equal to a hundred of the best of the enemy's warriors and that the best of David's warriors were equal to a thousand of the enemy's warriors. You better understand today, beloved, this was not a mob. This was a team and it was a team that needed a leader. See, God does not work through mobs. It pains my heart to see Christian representation on January 6th at the Capitol because that's not the way God works. God does not work through mobs. Many of our churches need to get rid of this mob mentality. God does not work through mobs. God works through called men and called women. God does not qualify the call. God does not call the qualified, but he qualifies who he calls. He trains and equips them for his service. He uses who he chooses and he chooses who he uses and so the bible says that there are about 400 men following david uh th 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 this principle is important for us today because it, it is important for us to understand that god always leads through a called and anointed individual he always leads through a called and anointed individual when the ark had to be built god didn't call 400 men he called noah when israel needed deliverance from egypt god didn't call a committee he called moses and over and over again in the scriptures we see that god's work is led by by an appointed and anointed individual. Uh, I like how uh, it's, it's written in Testimonies for the Church, volume 6, page 40, uh, chapter 40 rather, page 322. It says, it is the accompaniment, accompaniment of the Holy Spirit of God that prepares workers, both men and women. I'm going to read that two more times for you. It says, it is the accompaniment of the Holy Spirit of God that prepares workers, both men and women. Again, I'm reading Testimonies for the Church, volume 6, chapter 40, page 322. It says, it is the accompaniment of the Holy Spirit of God that prepares workers, both men and women, to become pastors to the flock of God. And at the same time, another very important principle we find in this text is that God very rarely ever calls an individual to work alone. Noah got, was called, but he said, go get your family. Moses was called, but he had the help of Aaron and the Israelites. David needed these 400 men, but even if he didn't think he did. These men were just as called and anointed as David was. But they were called and anointed to follow and support David. And he was called and anointed to lead them. And I wish I could park here parenthetically to let you know, know your role, right? Because uh, some of us are called to follow, but we try to lead. And some of us are called to lead, but we want to follow. But you've got to know where you stand. You've got to know what God called you to do. When God has called you to lead, you walk in your anointing. You stand in your board meeting with your chest out and your shoulders square. You stand confidently in the face of opposition because you know that if God be for you, who can prevail against you? When God called you to lead, you lead confidently. But then some of us, God has called us to follow. And that means that you've got to learn that when the majority has spoken, it's time to shut your mouth. When the church has made a decision, it's time for everyone else to say amen. And we've got to stop trying to form insurrections and, and trying to form agitation and learn to notice 
sit down and, and let the leaders lead and the followers follow. The Bible says in John 13, 16, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he who sent him. And all I'm trying to suggest today as I get ready to take my seat is that when we adjust our attitude, God will adjust our altitude. Not every follower is meant to follow permanently, but sometimes if you can be faithful in the following, God will appoint you to leading. And not every leader is is anointed to lead forever. You've got to learn to lead as best as God can through you. And then when God is finished with you, to get up out of the way and let the next person take the, 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 the baton and lead them to higher heights. Have I got a witness in the building today? So the Bible says in verse 3 and 4, it says, David went from there to Mitzpah of Moab and he said to the king of Moab, please let my father and my mother stay with you till I know, oh I feel right good tonight, till I know what God will do for me. And verse 4 it says, he left them with the king of Moab and they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. These verses show the wonderful love and obedience of David. Notice that David had his own issues. But he still took time, Sister Raquel, he still took time to care for his parents. Sometimes when we're going through trials, we think that our problems give us license to be unloving or, unself or selfish. But David shows us that despite his own trials that were going on, through it, through, uh, although we have our own stuff going on, we must still care for others, including and especially our parents, instead of becoming self-focused in times of trial. Because a lot of the times, hear me today, it is when you start caring for somebody else that God breaks through in your life. Job was going through the time, the trial of his life, and his situation didn't turn around until he turned around and prayed for his friends. There were four guys lowered through the roof right at the feet of Jesus. And the Bible, I'm sure that those individuals had needs of their own that they would have loved for Jesus to give his attention to. But, the, but instead, they found somebody with a greater need than them. And they tore up the roof and laid him down to Jesus' feet and said, Jesus, can you fix this for me? And the Bible says that Jesus didn't see the faith of the man on the bed. He saw the faith of the four that tore up the roof. And not only do these texts show David's love, but it also shows his obedience. Even though David did not have a problem-free home, he still understood that he was obligated to obey the fifth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother. And David takes them to the king of Moab and says, please let my father and mother stay here with you. David took his parents to Moab because his great-grandmother Ruth was a Moabite. And so he wanted his parents to feel safe in whatever battles he may face in the future. And so he says in verse 3, he says, let them stay here until I know what God will do for me. You see, David did not know the whole story. He knew that he was anointed by God and he knew that he will eventually become king. He knew the end, but he didn't know how God would get him there. And I wonder if anybody could identify with David in the hold today. Does anybody feel like you're in the hold of your life? You, you're waiting for that, diagnos the, that diagnosis. You're waiting for that promotion. You're waiting for what you know God has promised to you. It's right there. You can feel it. You can smell it. You can see it, but you just can't hold it. You're in the hold. And I got a word for you. While you're in the cave, you need to wait on the Lord. The story is told of a boy who went to the store with his mother, hoping that she would be able to buy him some candy so he patiently waited he helped his mother put the groceries in the cart you know how we are when we want something he rang up when she rang up the groceries she realized that she did not have enough money to buy him any candy so the boy was sad and the store owner looked at the little boy's face his sad face and told him that he saw him helping his mother with her groceries and that he could reach into the candy jar and take some candy the boy said no the store owner insisted that he take some candy the boy said no. The store man reached into the jar and gave the boy a handful of candy. And as the smiling boy walked out of the store, his mother asked, why did you just take the candy when the store owner told you to? And the little boy looked at his mother with a big smile on his face. He said, the owner's hands are bigger than mine. And I knew if I waited, I would get more handy 
more candy from his hands than if I put my own hands in there. And I just stopped by to let you know today to wait on the Lord. Be of good cheer. His hands are bigger than your hands. His hands are bigger than my hands. He sees all and he knows all. And God is in control. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And one thing you must always remember about God is that when you feel as if you're down to nothing, you better know that God is up to something. No wonder Paul said uh, that 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 uh, in Romans chapter eight and verse twenty eight uh, that we know um, that 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 all things uh, work together for good uh, to them that love God uh, to those who are the called uh, according to His purpose. Uh, you may not see your change yet, uh, but it's happening. It's happening. And so the story closes with the prophet Gad counseling David to leave his stronghold. He told him to leave the cave and go back to the land of Judah. And this probably wasn't what David wanted to hear. The prophet was essentially saying to David, leave your stronghold and go to the stronghold of Saul. But David obeyed anyway. What David had to learn and what we need to learn is to trust God even in the midst of danger. Not just on the safe side. It's easy to trust God when things are safe. But even in the midst of danger. Because if God can protect you at Walmart, he can protect you at worship. God wanted David to go back to Judah so that he could do some good there. And David might have thought that he would wait out the years and kind of sit back and relax and do nothing but stay isolated in the wilderness for years until Saul died and then he'll be king. By David going back to Judah, God would exercise David's faith, wisdom, and courage, which would prepare him to lead God's kingdom. And increase his reputation among the people. David didn't know the whole story. But he knew that he was already anointed to be the next king of Israel. But he didn't have any idea how God would get him there. So David had to trust and obey when he didn't know what God would do. And it reminds me of another king that had to shelter in place for three days to save us from sin. But thank God that there was an exit strategy. And the exit strategy was for David, and the exit strategy was to shelter in place in the cave of Dullam temporarily, to secure his family's safety, to support those who needed him, and then to come out showing God's keeping power. But the exit strategy for Jesus, including leaving the splendor of heaven, withdrawing himself from the celestial majesty of glory, coming down to the sin-cursed earth, and going to the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus' exit strategy included being beaten, blooded, battered, and bruised. It included being stripped and being hung on a cross. It included dying for us while we were yet sinners, and spending three days sheltered in the grave. But thank God today that if he stayed in the tomb, we would be eternally doomed. But thank God for the exit strategy. Thank God that he rose early Sunday morning with all power in his hands and he ascended into heavenly courts to intercede on our behalf before his heavenly father and because he fulfilled his exit strategy, we have an exit strategy. What is our exit strategy? Well, you can find it in John 14. It says, let not your hearts be troubled if you believe in God believe also in me in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you he said I go to prepare a place for you and then he says if I go I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also thank God today that we've got an exit strategy I thank God today that this world as we know it is not our final home we are pilgrims we are strangers we're traveling through this barren land but one day he that shall come will come and will not tarry and we will exit from this atmosphere and go into the stratosphere and into the celestial sphere and we will spend the ceaseless ages of eternity in celestial courts with Jesus. That's the exit strategy and the opportunity is afforded to all of us. 
it's afforded to all of us to exit this sin-cursed earth. And I pray that all of us would be there when the saints go marching in. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word today. And Lord, we thank you for reminding us through your son David, a man after your own heart, that you got an exit strategy for him and you got an exit strategy for us. And if you had an exit strategy for Jesus, he went into the grave and you had an exit strategy for him. That shows that you got an exit strategy for us. Let us not be confined by the, the circumstances we find ourselves in today. But Lord, renew our minds and remind us that you've got a plan and that all that is going on now is working together for your good. Oh, for grace to trust you more. That is our prayer, God. Give us that grace to trust you more. Let us use this season to reset, to recommit, to reconnect with you so that we can come out stronger and to do what you've anointed us to do. We thank you for all of our youth and young adults, every senior, every member, every child. We thank you for the angel of this house. And Lord, we pray that all of us will be in that number when the saints go marching in. For we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Desired of the Lord. One thing have I desired that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord to behold your beauty, to inquire in your temple, in the secret of your presence you shall. Hide me. I will see.